Hey crew, we're going to talk about section 2.2 in the Big Ideas textbook, and the subject is reasoning. We're going to go over inductive and deductive reasoning. Mr. Mitchell, I feel like I'm being tortured. Have I fallen asleep and woken up in English class? Or maybe suddenly I'm in college and I go to Hell State University? What are we doing? I thought this was math class. Before I get started, why don't I tell you why we're doing this? Section two, chapter two in the book is all about thinking. And it just so happens that you guys are in geometry class this year. And geometry is the math that takes you from solving equations to proving equations. To create new math, you have to prove what you are doing. So this entire chapter two is about math, yes, but also thinking. That's why we have these funny definitions. That's why we're talking about reasoning and logic. It is to get you thinking about math and thinking about how to prove something that has never before been proven. Ain't nobody got time for that. I don't know about this, Mr. Mitchell. I'm intimidated. It's a terrible year for school. We got a pandemic. I don't know if I can learn all this stuff. I'm going to need your help. Listen, the other benefit to studying how to think in math class is that it prepares you for how to think as an adult out of high school. They save geometry for 10th and 11th grade. People need time to mature. The neurons in your brain are closing one by one up through the age of about 24. And now's the time to start expanding your thinking. We're here to help with this. I will help. We'll help. Not every unit in the book is like this, but this one has vocabulary, new terms, and it forces you to think in new and different ways. So welcome to the lesson. 2.2 is the section of the book. And please do set up two pieces of paper. I use two blank pieces of eight and a half by 11 paper. So take a minute and set yourself up there. Pause the video if you need. We will learn to distinguish inductive and deductive reasoning as it applies to not only life, but mathematics. We're gonna start with inductive reasoning. So I'm gonna have four vocabulary today vocabulary words today, and when I write them, I'm going to kind of put a rectangle around them just so they pop out of my notes page. I encourage you guys to not just watch the video, but write, start, stop the video, take your time, and enter this process here of writing listening, and speaking back to yourself all at the same time. It will help you learn. Inductive reasoning is a form of thinking, a form of making conclusions. And this one is making conclusions based on observations and intuition. Okay, I've given you kind of a general definition, and now I'm going to break it down even to fewer words. This is not English class. You're right. Patterns used to write a conjecture. Okay, well, I... Maybe I don't totally understand that because I don't know what a conjecture is. So let me give you that one too. Conjecture. Now I have seen this used in English classrooms. Uh, lawyers, for example, if you want to be a lawyer someday, they use the term conjecture. A conjecture is an unproven statement based on observations.
in the textbook I'm on page 76 and we're going to start with a few examples. I've given you a definition. We're going to use some examples that are both from the textbook and some that are just from real life. And so I'm going to make a little break in my notes here. Examples of inductive reasoning. And you guys have all done this before. You just didn't know that it had a name. And you'll see what I mean in the second example. So I'm going to make this kind of a double line. My first example comes from page 76. And you can see the image of it to the left. Okay. And I am going to probably trim my video a little bit, but what I'm about to do is to take a nickel and draw myself four circles. So to save video time, you're gonna see a moment here where my circles jump to four, but this is all I'm gonna do. The example looks like this in their figure one. Okay, so the circle is shaded in its top half. Describe how to sketch the fourth figure in the pattern and then sketch the fourth figure. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and draw the first three that they have for me. And then this part is shaded. Oof, and then this one. Well, I'm seeing a pattern here. They all have a horizontal line. And this one, I have to then try, kind of draw an X. And this one is shaded. And it says draw the fourth one. And so this illustrates inductive reasoning. The circle keeps getting divided like somebody is cutting a pizza, is how I think of it. If I wanted to sketch the fourth figure in this series, make figure four, I'm looking at a pattern. Mm, okay, well, they all have the horizontal bar, so I'm just gonna assume that's true. I'm gonna take a shot there. And then I'm gonna say, well, this one has, this circle, figure one, has a single line. This one has one, two lines. And this one has one, two, three lines. And every time, and really in geometry, I should say line segments. So every time the line segments go across the circle, they make it into roughly equal size parts. And so I'm going to try that one more time. See if this pattern holds. I'm going to try one, two, three, and four. And this is the classic pizza cut. If you have a job working around town at Pizza Hut or Domino's or Panjo's, this is the pizza cut. And it seems like just above, so in the top half of the circle and just above the horizontal line and to the left, so I'm going to take a shot at this one. I think this is my next shaded area. The question here was, what's next? And we have used inductive reasoning, a pattern based on observations and intuition to predict what comes next in the series. Here's an example from everyday life. And I'm going to put M because this is Mr. Mitchell's example. See if this is true for your household. Every morning, my grouchy parents have coffee. That's an observation. We can build an intuition, a pattern for the future. What's next? Based on this observation, I can come up with a conjecture, a prediction, a conclusion based on my thinking. I think 
conjecture tomorrow they will have coffee based on my observation that every morning my parents have coffee and they're grouchy maybe there's an addiction at play here tomorrow they will have coffee it's not based on facts there is no certain way to know that coffee will happen tomorrow but that's my conjecture tomorrow they will have coffee and it seems likely to be true this is a form of reasoning i can assume i can reason that every morning my grouchy parents have coffee so tomorrow they will have coffee again the conjecture is that prediction that unproven statement based on observations and let's try one with math so this is example two and this is on page 77 let's make and test a conjecture And we're going to do this about, about three consecutive integers. Okay, consecutive, one after the other, integers, whole numbers. Um, the example would be one, two, three. We are looking at patterns. So if I just picked three numbers in a row, one plus two plus three, and I add them up, let's see, one plus two is three, three and three is six. Okay, I could factor that. Um, here's one of the factors of six. It is two times three. Three plus four plus five. Okay, so 3 plus 4 is 7. 7 and 5 is 12. And we could factor 12. That is 4 times 3. Hmm. Pattern. Let's try this. 7 plus 8 plus 9 equals 24. And 24, one of the factors, factored pairs, is... 8 times 3. So we have, excuse me for going off the page, we have built a pattern here. And I'm going to write a conjecture. The sum, which is to add them up, of 3 consecutive numbers, Excuse me, I should say these are, well, they're numbers, but this works best with integers, whole numbers, is 3 times the second number in the series. So this is a demonstration of inductive reasoning in mathematics. It's just a pattern that's been observed. The conjecture, unproven so far, is that this would hold true for all future cases. You take any three numbers, whole numbers, add them up, and see if the middle number times three equals that sum. Maybe you want to try it with some big numbers. Pause the video. Think about this. Inductive reasoning is taking this pattern and making conclusions from it. We're going to bring one more vocabulary here. The counter example. And I bet a bunch of you know what this is already. The counter example. All right, so... Let's keep that consistent. I'm making a vocabulary word here. And I'll say that you can show a conjecture is false. False. 
And remember this past week we talked about conditional conditional statements and we evaluated them as true and false. You can show that a conjecture is false by finding just one counterexample. So a counterexample, and in the book they give you a definition. What they say is to show that a conjecture is true, you must show that it is true for all cases. You can show that a conjecture is false, however, by finding just one counterexample. And lawyers live and die by this kind of language to prove a case. A counterexample is a specific case for which the conjecture is false. You guys are doing great. We have completed one page of notes. Now I'm putting a little P2 up here in the corner to tell me that this is page two. I flipped it over or maybe a second piece of paper for yourself. Or if you write big, maybe you're on to your third or fourth. And this is deductive reasoning. And I'm going to put my rectangle around it. Deductive reasoning, a different kind of reasoning based on facts, definitions, evidence, accepted properties. And here we kind of mean math properties. And, and this is why we practiced it last week, the laws of logic. And they are used to form a conclusion. A different kind of thinking, basing a conclusion on facts. Are you a reader? Because I can give you a great reference that will help with understanding this. So I'm going to put this question here. Reader, do you read the classics? Think Sherlock Holmes. And maybe you've seen the uh, BBC series with Benedict Cumberpatch. The character, the fictional character of Sherlock Holmes is known, is famous for using deductive reasoning to solve his cases. So we're going to look at some examples of deductive reasoning. And I'm going to give my little double lines here again. Okay, not in the book, so kind of example from Mr. Mitchell. Here is a phrase that uses deductive reasoning. All numbers that end, I'll say ending, with a five or a zero are divisible by five. And you probably know this from the way back. Any number that ends in a five or a zero, it is divisible by five. You can divide it by five and get an even number. So, all numbers ending with a 5 or a 0 are divisible by 5. That is a fact. The number 85, it ends with a 5. Conclusion that I can draw for this. You already know the conclusion. 85 must be divisible by 5.
deductive reasoning. Maybe you would see this in a science classroom. This is example 7 on page 79. Here come the accepted properties, facts, and definitions. All reptiles are cold-blooded. That is a fact. That is how we've divided up the animal kingdom. We put all the cold-blooded animals in one group called reptiles. That is how we order it. Ah, but parrots, this is in the example. Parrots are not cold-blooded. Do you see the conclusion that we're about to reach? Think about it. What are we about to conclude? All reptiles are cold-blooded. Parrots are not cold-blooded. Therefore, conclusion, we can say, let's put the conclusion part so when you look back over your notes before a test, you'll know what the conclusion was. Parrots, drum roll, big news, are not reptiles. Maybe you just laughed out loud at home thinking about parrots being reptiles. We know they're not. But this is the structure of coming up with logical explanations for reaching a conclusion. We can prove things this way. We used one fact, all reptiles are cold-blooded. We used a second fact, parrots are not cold-blooded, to make the conclusion, parrots are not reptiles. Sherlock Holmes does this with murder mysteries in the books written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So another example, I'm gonna give this one an M since it's not in the book. This is a famous one. Maybe you've seen this on a wall somewhere at the middle school. If A equals B and, oh, a second condition, B equals C, recognize this as the hypothesis of a logical, I mean, excuse me, of a conditional statement, we can conclude then A equals C. Our conclusion is here in the conditional statement. Con, excuse me, conclusion. Our conclusion. A equals C. Now think about it. We're looking at if whatever number these are, A equals B and B equals C, then we've used the conditional statement from last week to structure this. Two facts lead to a conclusion that is not here nor there. A equals C. And this one is famous. It is the transitive property of mathematics. The transitive property. And you can use language like this to prove math. Not just to solve an equation, but to prove why. And when new mathematics is discovered, by scientists and they publish it in peer-reviewed journal articles, they have to prove it when they expose it to the world. They have to tell everybody how it works and prove it. And that kind of wraps up kind of a general look at inductive and deductive reasoning. I'm going to leave you with some help for rem remembering Gosh, Mr. Mitchell, I feel like I'm in English with all this writing. Let's start with inductive. Okay. So I just write the word and then an arrow. And then a couple of things to help me remember it. I'm picking two specific words. Inductive, I think of observations. And I think of intuition. 
is how I reach a conclusion. And the reason I chose these two words is that all three start with a vowel. And it's a helpful way for me to remember this. When it comes to deductive, it starts with a consonant. Deductive. Let me draw another arrow here. And I'm going to say facts, logic, and yes, Sherlock Holmes. And these are the consonants that can help me remember. All right, book. You guys have an assignment loaded to big ideas. All classrooms in geometry, Mr. Scott, Miss Cytek, and me. And there are 16 problems. And you will find them mostly words. I wish you luck today. If you've never taken an opportunity to explore the Big Ideas website, please give it another look. You go to the Student Dynamic eBook, and on the left side of the screen is a table of contents. It's an easy way to surf to certain parts of the book to look things up. You can also find selected answers to some problems in the back of the book. I recommend having a look. It helps you check things as you go along. And inside your dynamic ebook, they call it, you can find buttons to click on, tutorial videos, and help in Espanol if you need something to help you translate some terms. Good luck today, crew. Bye for now.